Jesus went up to the capital city of his people to make a double demonstration against imperial power and conservative religious collaboration with imperial power. Jesus went up to the capital city of his people to make a double demonstration, a double demonstration against both Roman imperial power and Jewish conservative collaboration with it. That's what I'm going to unfold a little bit. Simply by reading Mark's Gospel. Marcus and I were introducing a, a bold new concept, read the text. <laughs> All of it. Jerusalem, of course, is the capital city. But the double demonstration, and I know that many people will be thinking, you're just taking stuff that's you know, from our 20th, late 20th, early 21st century, and you're dumping it back in the first century. Read the text. A double demonstration. I will use our name, our word, Sunday and Monday. On Sunday and Monday, we call Palm Sunday and Monday of, of the Holy Week, the first thing Jesus does is a demonstration against Roman imperial power. This we know. Pilate, who represented Rome, the governor of Judea, his headquarters was at Caesarea on the coast. He came up to the capital city whenever there was a major feast, and especially for the feast of Passover, when Jewish people were celebrating freedom from Egyptian oppression when they were under Roman oppression. It was tinderbox atmosphere and zero toleration for anything. Very dangerous. We know of two major riots during Passover in the first century. So Pilate would be coming up from the west. Of course he would be mounted on a horse. He would be leading his auxiliary troops. Now they're not legionary troops. There are no legionary troops in, in the Jewish homeland at this time. But he's bringing up extra troops to garrison the city during Passover. Now we also know that Jesus entered the city and with dramatic license, that means we can't prove it, but that means you can't disprove it either, we're imagining the two of them coming at the same time. Because if you're making a demonstration, timing is everything. So Jesus enters on what we call Palm Sunday, and we call it with terrible, bad name, the triumphal entry. It is an anti-triumphal entry. Jesus comes in on a donkey. And the background of that is the prophecy in Zechariah 9, where the Messiah, the Christ, will enter Jerusalem, not on a war horse, not even on a horse, not even on a mule, on a donkey. And it is a caricature and a lampoon of Alexander the Great, which at the time of Zechariah 9 is coming down the Levantine coast and he has destroyed Tyre, devastated it, slaughtered it. He's done the same to Gaza. He's come into Jerusalem because Jerusalem opened the gates. And he's come in, of course, on his war horse. Zachary says the Messiah comes in on a donkey and abolishes war forever. So Jesus is enacting a prophetic symbol. He's fulfilling it. Actually, in, in Zachary, there's sort of poetic parallelism. It says he comes in on a donkey and on a colt. That's simply saying the same thing twice, which is Hebrew poetry. But Matthew, when he reads it, says he comes in on a donkey and a colt. Now, people sometimes say that's kind of stupid. Is Jesus riding two animals? Of course not. The point that Matthew is making is he's riding a donkey with a colt alongside it, which means it's a female donkey. So you've come right down as low as you can go in the hierarchy of coming into the city. Not a horse, not a mule, not a male donkey, a female donkey with a little colt trotting by her side. And on that picture in the cover of the last week, actually the original has, of course, the colt by the side of the female donkey. So it's an anti-triumph, it's a mockery, it's a lampoon, actually, of how a conqueror enters a city. That's the demonstration. And I, I would insist on the word demonstration because it's a setup. Obviously, Jesus can't come from Galilee with the donkey with him, 
So when you read the story, Jesus tells them, go tell the owner, we need the donkey now. It tells you as clearly as Mark can, this is all arranged. It's a demonstration. So the first demonstration is against Roman imperial power. It mocks it in the name of the hope of a messiah who would be a non-violent messiah coming in on a donkey. The second one is on Monday. And it's very deliberate on Monday because in Mark's gospel, Jesus goes in on Sunday night to the temple, looks around and leaves. You don't do a demonstration late in the evening. You do a demonstration in time to catch the evening news. No. no. You do it in the morning when everyone is there. So Jesus deliberately goes in on Sunday night, looks around, leaves. On the morning, once again, our name is very, very unfortunate. We call it the cleansing of the temple. Very, very unfortunate. That's not what's happening at all. Once again, there's a prophetic background. Zachary for the first one. This is Jeremiah 7. And Jesus quotes him. That's how I know it. Jeremiah 7, Jeremiah is told to go and stand in front of the temple on a day of high festival and warn the people that if they think that worship excuses them from justice, that God will destroy the temple. It's a warning that God wants justice and not worship as an excuse from it. And of course, obviously, that applies to church, to temple, to mosque. The purpose of worship is to be plugged into God's justice. You cannot worship God in a state of injustice because God is the God of justice, says Jeremiah. So he tells them, don't think you've got to the temple. Say, the temple, the temple, the temple. <sighs> We're safe. If you do that, says Jeremiah, God speaking, you have turned my house into a den of thieves. Now just think. A den of thieves ain't where thieves do their thieving. A den is a safe house, a hideaway, a, an escape house, as it were. They've done their thieving, their injustice elsewhere, and they think they've got to the temple, and everything is fine as long as they worship God. God's into worship, after all, not justice. And God says, if you do that, I will destroy the temple. What Jesus is doing in this second demonstration is not cleansing the temple. In one sense, he's doing something much more radical. He's symbolically destroying it. He's fulfilling Jeremiah. He's fulfilling Jeremiah because the basis of the temple, of course, is the fiscal tax, which every Jew willingly, every male Jew, at least across the entire Jewish world, willingly, freely paid to support the temple in their home city. Of course. And there is nothing wrong with the money changers. They're seated in the outer court, the court of the Gentiles. They're seated there to change the money as a convenience for people to turn it into the money for the temple tax. That they are doing anything wrong, that they're defrauding anyone, is absolutely unfounded and dancing very close to anti-Semitism. So the point of overturning the tables of the money changers is destroying the fiscal support of the temple. The temple is closed down. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So we have two symbols. One is against Roman imperial theology, let's say. The other is against collaboration with it. And it is, it is the most conservative elements who are collaborating, the Sadducees rather than the Pharisees who are the liberals. Now, when you look at that, though, you say to yourself, isn't he trying to provoke it? Isn't he looking for it? This is Passover. This is zero toleration for even sneezing too loudly. And he's done two demonstrations. Surely he's looking to get himself killed. So again, the text becomes very important. When you read the text, you realize that Mark insists and keeps mentioning that the crowd is on the side of Jesus. The crowd is on the side of Jesus. He has a protective screen against the authorities of his own people. Mark makes that quite clear. The authorities of his own people are very, very much scared, and it's not necessary to demonize them. They're very much scared that any demonstration could bring down the Romans like a ton of marble on them. And they're right. 
This is dangerous stuff. The fact that it's nonviolent, which it is, doesn't mean it's not dangerous. What if the Romans misunderstand, or what if they decide that we'll just attack in any case and let God sort it out? On Sunday, we just saw it. As Jesus enters, the crowd is applauding him. They're on his side. And you think, well, maybe after this incident in the temple, they're not. But right after the incident in the temple, Mark says, the authorities wanted to move against him, but they feared the crowd. That's Monday. Comes Tuesday. There's all sorts of debates between Jesus and the authorities in the temple. They're trying to separate him from the crowd. Three times on Tuesday, Mark mentions they couldn't move against him because the crowd were on his side. He mentions it three times. In other words, he wants you to understand this. So that brings us to Wednesday morning in Mark's story. And Wednesday morning, of course, it looks like it's over. The authorities say we cannot move against Jesus during the festival because there might be a riot. They give up in plain language. If you're following this like a drama, on Wednesday morning, Jesus has got away with it. And that is very important for me, understanding his intention. He thinks, he expects to get away with it. The crowd's protecting him. It's too dangerous. It could cause a riot to move against Jesus. Better let him do whatever he's doing than risk a riot. That's the point at which Judas Iscariot becomes crucial. That's when Judas says, I can tell you where he is at night. I can tell you where he is in the darkness. I can tell you where you can get him apart from the crowd. Then you can capture him, have this all over before anyone knows anything about it. In the logic of the story, it is Judas Iscariot, in a way, more even in a way than either Caiaphas or Pilate, who is the linchpin in the plot. One final point. What about that crowd on Friday, though? Isn't there a crowd also on Friday crying out, crucify him, crucify him? Continue it to Mark's story. There's a crowd on Friday. There's another crowd on Friday. This is the crowd that goes up and says to Pilate, we want to get Barabbas out. Now back up a bit. According to Mark's story, Pilate will allow one prisoner, anyone the crowd asked for, out of prison in honor of the Passover feast. Now, let's leave that aside, whether that is historically likely or not. It's in the story. So there's an open paschal amnesty, open in the sense that you can come up and get whomever you want. The crowd, says Mark, comes up to get Barabbas out. Barabbas is identified as a Jewish, we might say a freedom fighter, who has had an insurrection, a violent insurrection against the Romans, and people have been killed, and Pilate has grabbed him and all his followers. Now, notice that. When the Romans moved against a violent revolutionary, you take the leader and all the followers you can get. This is crucial for our understanding that Jesus is considered by the Romans, by Pilate, as a non-violent revolutionary, or they have gone after as many of his followers as they could as well. In any case, we have two prisoners, Pilate and Barabbas, in Mark's story. And Pilate makes the correct judgment. Of these two, the ones when he does not want to free is Barabbas. Barabbas is much more dangerous. The crowd come up from Barabbas, and when Jesus, excuse me, when Pilate tries to free Jesus, they insist, no, no, we want Barabbas. Final point. If I'm asked as a historian, how big is this crowd we're talking about? Crowd, as you know, is, is an open number. You are a very, very good crowd to come and listen to a sermon on Friday at noon. You would be a disaster at a Super Bowl. <laughs> if I was asked, did I have a nice crowd, I'd say I had a wonderful crowd. So, a crowd depends on the, on the situation. If somebody said the president had a crowd of senators in the Oval Office for the signing of the new law, I would figure, you know, 15 maybe. 